Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies in the Minor Prophets, and we return to that which is written by Sister White, so we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we might more directly understand the importance of these items for us today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your instruction and your direction at this time in this earth's history. We ask, Father, for your watch care. We need your guidance. As we open your word, we need your blessing. We ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit. May your spirit attend us, instruct us, and open our minds so that we may understand more and apply these items properly. May your angels also attend us. As we are assembled here together today, Father, we thank you for your promise that where two or more are gathered there, you will be also. Help us so that on this Sabbath, our, main, our minds may be open, willing, and ready to learn of that that you would have us to learn today so that it may be properly applied to give this message that you would want us to give in this earth's history. Direct us now, be with us each one. For this we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, last Sabbath we began going over portions of Zephaniah chapter 2. And we're going to continue in this document that Mrs. White had written in 1861. Now, as Sister White has written, a man who does not love manual labor and is naturally easy and indolent will never make a successful preacher. He will ever lack self-denial, perseverance, and energy. He will never make a thorough workman in spiritual things. There will ever be seen the love of ease and the dislike to exertion in matters of the church, and there will be no disposition to tax the mental faculties. What exactly is she saying here? She said this in several other places in different manners, but what is she saying here? Well, if somebody's not useful in 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 physical things, like if they can't can't be successful in in real life, they're not going to be um, successful in the church. Okay. And so, I mean, there are some people who, I mean, I actually I know of a pastor who he became a pastor because he thought it would be easy. He didn't really want to work. Okay. How was he as a pastor? Uh, a terrible pastor, of course. He didn't do anything. When... When the only school that Mrs. White was a board member of was established, what was the parameters of that school? Um, well, that it would be like a farm. That okay. there was going to be um, lots of people would be trained in manual labor so that they could be practical. Was it not a point that if you were going to err on one side or the other, 
you should be doing more physical labor than book and, learning or mental labor. Yeah. I think we have all known those that do not love manual labor and they believe that they should be lifelong students. Mm -hmm. I have known many pastors like this. Mm -hmm. Where getting an understanding with them about manual labor is just something that does not happen. Yet I have known others, one that I can think of right now, worked in his formative years in a sawmill, was also drafted into the army and wound up in a, an army hospital. He knew well the value of the physical labor, mm -hmm. but he also understood the balance that needed to be done. And he was one incredible pastor. Now, in this document, we're going to be talking about a specific family, and we need to be able to pay attention to what we're seeing here. Because my premise, when I went through these documents, I went looking for anything that had to do with Zephaniah chapter two. This one family is an example of what happens when you are more focused on the mental than on a balanced approach to life. <clears throat> Brother Cottrell could do a great amount of good with his pen. His mental powers have not been troubled and overtaxed and worn as have those of some of the preachers. His bodily strength and nervous system have not been shattered. His thoughts can be clear upon important points of truth. He should use his pen. He could have employed time that has been lost in searching the Bible for evidences upon different points of truth and letting his light shine. His brain should be taxed more for he can bear it. And some others of our minister's mind should be taxed less. Brother Cottrell has a dislike to do anything laborious. His mind and body should be taxed more. He should feel that the cause of God is a part of him, that the paper publishing the truth is as dear to him as his children, that he has a responsibility resting upon him to make it interesting and profitable. No one is as much at leisure to set his mind to the work as he. What is it saying about this brother Cottrell? Well, he's lazy. Thank you. He is physically and mentally lazy. I have been shown that it was of but little use for Brother Cottrell to engage with Brother Andrews in tent labor, for he cannot interest and hold a congregation, and too much labor comes on Brother Andrews. It would be better for Brother Cottrell to labor out by himself, and then his labor will accomplish more and tell for all it is worth. He should not go over and over where he has lived and where his lack has been so sensibly felt. There are churches that have no labor, places where they greatly need help. Brother Cottrell should take hold in some such place and labor to build up and strengthen. By persevering labor, he can do much. He can show fruits of his labor, gain confidence in himself, and his gift will improve. In a new field, Brother Cottrell could do more than to remain in one place year after year and go over the same ground. 
How many times do we see pastors coming to an area and those pastors remain year after year? Well, it's even worse than it used to be. Is this the manner in which w the work should be approached? Is this what she is saying, that we should just appoint a pastor to an area and let him stay in that area regardless? No, because they, they're not as effective over a long period of time. You know, yeah. they, get, they get in a comfortable sort of routine. They need to be challenged. In my past, I found it very interesting. There was one Sabbath that the, uh, the pastor of the church I was then attending did not show up. His wife was giving all sorts of reasons, none of which made sense. All of a sudden, a pastor that I knew fairly well walks in the door. He gave a message that was very heartily received and then left. Now, I was surprised because this was the pastor of the church where my mother would attend. Mm. So as I left that church, I called my mother and I asked her very directly. So who was it that spoke for you today? And she came back with the question, was it at your church where our pastor was speaking? We were told that there had been an emergency with a pastor somewhere and that our pastor had been called away. Now, in these situations, pastors will encounter difficulties. The question we have, are they willing to rely upon God when they, re when they encounter these difficulties, or are they going to rely upon their own strength? Now, here is Brother Cottrell. He didn't want to work hard. Physical labor was an anathema to him. And because of this, mental labor was also something that he did not hold to. And she was giving the admonition that Brother Cottrell could do more than to remain in one place year after year, going over the same ground. Brother Cottrell must counteract by earnest activity and energy on his part, the precept and example he has acted out in Mill Grove and other places. Brother Cottrell must have more self-reliance and depend more upon his own energies. He notices every unpleasant feeling too much and in, in his imagination suffers much where suffering does not really exist. He has rested so much and had so easy a time for years that he is not inured to any exertions. But God requires Brother Cottrell to be economical of his time and not lose so many hours for which he can show nothing. Such an example is a miserable one to set before the flock of God. Was Brother Cottrell being called to be a minister? Mm-hmm. Are we all not called to be ministers for Christ? Yep. Should we take Brother Cottrell as our example? <laughs> no. Okay. 
Brother Cottrell should not engage in organizing churches, for he is not thorough. He does not go deep enough. He does not hew close enough. And some are brought into the church who are unfit and who prove a great burden to the church. What do we see in this statement? Well, there's some people, they, they, they can work for God, but there's things that they're not capable of doing. Um, I'm not sure particularly what details she's talking about as far as he's not thorough. I'm not sure what she means by an organizing a church. Just, I don't know if it's the, there's details probably that he does not address that he needs to. Okay, now... <clears throat> Part of what I have been learning is I have been reading and preparing with this document. And there is there are points in here that will relate directly to Zephaniah chapter 2. Mm -hmm. But the Cottrell family is one that has had quite a an impact upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. Well, one is their rejection of the spirit of prophecy. Well, the point is, and, and what, what I want, what I would like you to examine for yourself, either in this prove me right or prove me wrong, I believe that the Cottrell family is a representation of four generations. Hmm. And it is an active representation because if we if we look at this brother Cottrell from 1861 all the way down to his great grandson who was born in 1912, I think we will see a, a representation of what we should not be doing. A part of the time, Brother Cottrell could labor to do good and to good advantage for the benefit of the cause of God. Let me read that again. A part of the time, Brother Cottrell could labor to good advantage for the benefit of the cause of God. He could labor successfully by writing, taking the burden upon him to contribute more largely for the paper than he has yet done. He can accomplish more. As a general thing, by taking up items and writing upon them, than he can by much preaching. It is his duty to study, to do all he can to advance the cause of God, to advance the interest of the paper and labor, not sparing himself, to convince souls of the truth. Brother Cottrell's life, as to conversation and deportment, has been good. He has had some success, but has not accomplished what he might had he used the strength of body and mind which God has given him. If I was going to distill this down, I would be saying that Brother Cottrell talks a good game. Mm -hmm. But he does not act or play a good game. Yeah, regarding the previous paragraph, I think that she's talking about not vetting people who wanted to come into the church. Like he didn't seem to discern their flaws or their good points or whatever. He didn't really sit down and really get to know them. So symbolically, how could you approach that? Well, we need to pray for the, the discernment of Christ. Like I was absolutely floored. I'll give you an example. I think it was a 2009 or 2010. I was going to the Transcona Church in Winnipeg. And I passed by some, a man who was standing outside the church building smoking. And I thought, well, I should have told him, asked him, like, what are you doing here, Neil? This is an SDA church. We don't allow smoking. I found out that he was a baptismal candidate and got baptized that day. 
It's horrifying. Well, two examples that I have. I was invited to an Adventist church after I'd been away from the church for, for a many number of years. As I walked up to this church, I wind up walking up to two men. One, as you just described, was smoking. The other, I knew fairly well. The one that I knew fairly well did not recognize me. He stuck out his hand and he said, hi, my name is John. We're happy to have you here today. I am, and I said, John, I know who you are. I would not shake his hand. And that shook him up. The guy that stood there smoking continued to smoke. Now, <clears throat> the same pastor of this church was presented with baptismal candidates. One candidate of one family, the pastor said, well, you're going to need to address your need, and we have a baptismal class for that. So here's some things to read. When you've read these over, give me a call, and then we'll put you in the baptismal class. Now, the other family had a party that wanted to be baptized. And the pastor said to the member of that family, you bet, let's get you baptized as soon as possible. It must be done. We must take care of this. It has to be done right now. No mention of anything regarding a baptismal class or understanding anything else. It's, we must do this now. Now, the first family was not considered extremely wealthy. The second family was considered a pillar of the church, and one member was exceedingly wealthy. The second family from the exceeding wealthy family was indeed baptized while he was high on methamphetamine. And the pastor said nothing. I have watched. Discuss. Sorry. I just said that's disgusting. And as an ex meth head, I wouldn't have allowed me to be baptized if I was still doing meth. Well, in this situation, in this same area, there had been a major evangelistic series. And this series led to over 200 baptisms into the Adventist church. Within a year, of the 200 that were baptized, two remained. We have too much that has gone on where we have mental work being done over a balance with the physical work. Too many believe this is easy, an easy way to make a living. All they're here for is a paycheck. It is the duty of Brother Cottrell to labor as hard according to his strength in the cause of God and to provide for his own family as Sister Cottrell labors according to her strength to provide for his wants and the wants of the family. <clears throat> it is Brother Cottrell's duty to wake up and labor as hard as his brethren and sisters who often labor under infirmities and with such weariness to provide for their families and to have wherewith to aid the cause of God, and to help Brother Cottrell among the rest. 
No one with Brother Cottrell's health and strength should yield and give up to feelings of weariness and little infirmities. His natural indolence must be overcome or his reward will be very small in the kingdom of heaven. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this reminds me of uh, just my present situation with uh, the guitar store. So when uh, I started the guitar store, um, I worked 100 hours a week. And, you know, one is I had to provide for my family. And, and I, I was open basically at every opportunity I could be open, except, of course, on Sabbath. And, um, you know, some people would question why. You know, you're open at times when you're not going to be, get, be getting much business. And the new owners kind of have this attitude. Well, you know, if it's not a busy day, um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't really be open. And even when the store was closed down for five weeks, uh, they could have been doing lots of work, but they'd come in late in the morning, work for a few hours, and they'd be gone in the afternoon. Instead, if I had the guitar store, um, I would have worked all through the night and done anything I could to keep the store open. And, you know, I think for some people, you know, they, they've been successful financially without, without a great deal of work. And it does happen. I mean, the race is not always to the swift or the battle to the strong. Right? There are some people who've had privileges that other people haven't from circumstances. And they don't understand what it takes to, to make something work. And those type of people can easily destroy the work of others that people have labored over for 22 years or whatever, um, without realizing that it, it, it's like in gardening. Um, that's one of the things I've learned doing agriculture. There's lots of things that you have to do that aren't harvesting. But if you don't do them, you're not going to be able to harvest. There's lots of things you, you do that when you're working that may not directly seem like they're productive. There's time that you have to spend. Um, but you can't just harvest a garden. You have to prepare the soil. You have to weed. You have to plant. You have to water. You have to tend to the plants. You have to take knowledge of what you plant and when. Uh, you have to pay attention to, you know, the frost late in, in the season and um, you know when to harvest. There's so many things that have to be done, but lots of people want to be there for the glory things. And so, you know, the things that we do in everyday life, the time that we spend may not we may not realize how much we're losing by not spending that time on the little things. Those little details over time are extremely important in the end result. Exactly. Brother Harvey Cottrell has had loose, slack habits of doing business. He has never seen the necessity of order, system, and organization in the church. He thinks if things were left more with the Lord and took their own natural course, come along as they would, it would look a lot more like the spirit leading the people and controlling the church. But there would be an unruly and evil spirit that could bring all the confusion necessary to satisfy the most disorderly and free, which would drive holy angels from them in disgust. Brother Harvey cannot see any need of the gifts, and he has been a great hindrance to the church in Mill Grove. His wife 
and Mary have suffered in their feelings. They desire to press fully with the body and to do the whole will of God from the heart. They fail in some things, but God regards their prayers and their desires to serve him. <clears throat> Here is an example of a house divided. Harvey Cottrell did not wish to follow any kind of order or system. Yet his wife, and I would have to assume Mary being his daughter, would look to work along with others for the benefit and for the good of the church. There's been a great lack in the Mill Grove Church. There is still a great lack there. There is not one there of sufficient age processing, possessing enough force of character and energy who is thoroughgoing and of sufficient influence to act as leader in the church. There needs to be a reform there. This loose, slack manner of doing business must be corrected. And every true child of God who believes the truth from the heart should take hold of this work of reform. Brother Brooks is now the best one to fill the place of leader in the meetings. He has tried to exert a good influence. His life has not been such as to reproach the cause of God. His wife has tried to follow the Lord in humility and to do his will. God has his eye upon all the precious souls who would serve him from the heart. Not one of them will be left to perish, although they may suffer much from surrounding influences. I could see how this statement could apply very directly with the movement today. Mm -hmm. If there had been a good and saving influence exerted in Mill Grove, there would now be now a flourishing church. There has been much labor bestowed in Mill Grove, but there has ever been a class there whose influence has been such as to counteract the efforts which have been made. Satan has been willing and has exalted that a certain class should profess the truth and manifest considerable zeal, for he can present them as the representatives of Sabbath keepers. Their disgusting manner and loose slack habits and their miserable influence generally might keep out the sensible and intelligence and intelligent who would be an honor to the cause if they should obey the truth. <clears throat> now in these situations, please consider, Mrs. White has given us many instructions that the world would find strange. Instructions in diet, instructions in dress, instructions in many different things. Yet many within the church today and some within the movement today choose not to accept all that Mrs. White has written. Well, Say, yeah, uh, so um, one of the, you know, one of the things that I see, and, and this, this goes back to the time that Tabo was uh, um, the leader here in Canada, is that um, there wasn't really a, like there was a talk of organization and these types of things. And a lot of the things that were done were talk. They weren't really, because I've sat on boards and I understand how to get things done. And people talked about things, but nothing was practical and nothing was done uh, in all kinds of areas. And, th and those types of things really bother me uh, when I see people have opinions and talk about things. and Because people want to, to look like they're doing something 
but not actually do anything. And, you know, this, this is a problem with in not just this movement, but a lot throughout Adventism. People want to be in charge of things, but they don't want to do things. And uh, I think this is part of what Ellen White is talking about. People want to have an influence because they think their ideas are the right ideas or their ways of doing things are the right ways of doing things. And often what they do is they hinder others from doing things. They hinder the work that needs to be done by putting um, rules, um, uh, all, all kinds of things that they do. I don't want to go into to details of what people do. And, and this is sort of, their influence is not productive as far as the movement is concerned. And, and we have this problem here in Alberta. Much of the problems that we had regarding uh, the 2520 were because of the character of many people who represented the 2520. And there was very little you could to do to undo their influence. You know, often we will say, well, people have rejected the 2520 because, you know, they're they're not interested in truth. But often they rejected it, not because of what we believed, but because of how we acted. Yep. We, we did not labor wisely or patiently for souls. Instead, it was easy to present things in a way that was unattractive and then to uh, uh, dismiss and uh, others who really were, were good people. Um, and the, you know, anyway, uh, you understand the point. I don't need to go into detail about it. We have seen in our in our past that there's been a lot of mistakes made. Mm -hmm. We have had to learn from those mistakes if we are going to be profitable workmen mm -hmm. for the Lord. So there are some issues mm -hmm. that we should address that we should take a look at. So, yeah, I don't know how, how we address them. The only thing that I can see for myself personally is, you know, God's given me a work to do and I have to do that work and I can't really worry about what other people how other people see it because I really would like to work in step with my brethren. Okay. That's always my desire um, to support whatever works being done. But when I don't see a work actually being done, then I'm going to just have to do the work on my own and hope that other joins, others join with me. Amen. Because right now, you know, I, I'm, I'm not telling people all the details of what's happening, but, you know, I've been brought out of my comfort zone uh, to have to do a work here. Right. And, you know, so, you know, we'll see how, how things unfold, but we, I really don't have any other choice. Either I just wait around for other people or I finally just take up the work. Uh, it reminds me a little bit. I remember when I was... Uh, I think I must have been 16, but uh, it was the first job I had. And uh, we were, I was working for an insulation company. And we, it was at the end of the, the day, and we were asked to uh, unload all these bags of ins, in, insulation out of a trailer, um, a semi trailer. And uh, the guys there, they decided that they were just going to have a cigarette break. So, of course, I don't smoke, but I also don't like taking breaks, and I wanted to get home, uh, so I unloaded the trailer myself, and they were all mad at me because now they had 
they didn't get paid as much because they were going to be paid this overtime for the extra time that they were working. Um, and so when I cleared out the truck, then now they, they have to leave early. Um, but I just wanted to get the job done. And, and that's really how we should be. We shouldn't be looking at you know, how much we're getting paid or anything like that. We should just get the job done. And, and that's one of the things totally I learned. Totally agree. Yeah, I learned this at Silver Hills as well when I was there. Um, just to, to do work for the work's sake, not about what you benefit, not for a paycheck, but because that work needs to be done. And, and some people only want to do the work where they get paid. They see something that, that they do where they don't get paid. They don't see the value in the work itself. And, there, and there's a great value in work. There's nothing to do with financial benefit. Right. <clears throat> okay, now there was a comment in the chat. We don't know when to speak and when to keep silent. And that is something that is very important for us to learn. Yeah, that's uh, um, Ecclesiastes chapter six. There's six. There's a time to speak and a time to to be silent. I can't remember exactly the verse number. Yeah, James talks a lot about speaking too, mm -hmm. speaking and keeping silent and controlling wrath. Yeah, it's chapter three. Yeah, a time to. Oh, sorry about that. I interrupted you. Yeah, it's Ecclesiastes 3, verse 7. Time to keep silence and a time to speak. And this next portion covers that as well. <clears throat> Satan would rather have a certain class be Sabbath keepers, for they serve his purpose in an excellent manner. If there is a tent meeting or general conference, <clears throat> those who have the least influence, whose appearance in general deportment is no recommendation to Sabbath keepers, but a reproach, who don't know when to speak and when to keep silent, will be sure to get to the meeting if possible. If they have unruly, uncultivated children, they will take them along. It is very unpleasant for those who have to weary themselves to entertain them. It is exceedingly trying to the patience of those who attend the meetings out of a sense of duty to do all the good they can. For these persons of uncultivated habits stand directly in the way of unbelievers. The most cutting truths presented, which if received by them in the heart, would condemn their lives and tear them all to pieces, they will assent to and shed tears over. Yet their lives are a living reproach. Their uncultivated manners are a reproach. Their slack, untidy dress and self-righteous conversation is a reproach. They are a burden, but never know it. They keep souls out of the truth. May this not be said of us. The poor and ignorant are not to be excluded from the privileges of the church, but they should be taught their place and then should keep it. They should be a saving influence in the church to teach them their place not to put themselves forward and exercise themselves in things which are too high for them. If these poor souls would find their place and keep it, the church would have a more saving influence. I don't believe that she is saying here to hold people down, but to bring people into the church so that they may learn. 
that they may come to an understanding, a clearer understanding of what it means to represent Christ. Yeah, people, people need to be educated. Now often, I mean, and I learned this with, with children, when somebody's doing something that uh, isn't correct, I mean, you don't just criticize them. You actually redirect them. Okay. You, you can lift people higher without tearing them down. Correct? I very much agreed. Yeah. Um, and I know with my kids, they often, you know, like, you know, often a parent will just say to a kid, stop doing this thing. But what I would do is I would just direct them in some other way. So that they, they didn't feel that I was always just stopping them having fun or whatever. I would just, you know, especially like on Sabbath, you don't just tell your kids, you can't do this, you can't do that. What you do is you just direct them in positive things. Of course, that takes time and energy. But it's definitely way better in the long run. Am I, am I uh, being heard? I can hear you sort of statically. Thank you. Yeah, you're not coming through as clearly as you normally do. Yeah. Is that any better? No, it's actually a little bit worse. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. York is numbered with the church, but he is of no benefit to the church. His influence has only been an injury to the cause of God. In his business, he moves from place to place, and everywhere he is known, he is a miserable representative of Sabbath keepers. Those who know him are led to say, if Sabbath keepers are like Mr. York and Mr. Davis, I don't want to be a Sabbath keeper. These men talk much in a very boasting, exalted manner in regard to themselves. They can pray and talk in the most important meetings long and earnestly. But it is all a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. There is no humility there. They are full of self-righteousness and are of that class who will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Our representation is hugely important. These men express much love to God and to the truth in words, but they are not converted to God. Peter followed Christ when he was upon the earth. He manifested much zeal for his master. He thought himself the most devoted and zealous of Christ's followers. And when Jesus said unto him, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, Luke twenty-two thirty-two. Peter was offended that his master should express doubts in regard to his faithfulness. He asserts that although all men should be offended, yet he would not. He would even die for his Lord. But he was ignorant of himself. And when he was brought to the test to endanger his life for his master, he openly denied him and protested with a cursing and a swearing that he knew not the man. Jesus looked upon Peter and then he remembered the words of his Lord. This boastful confidence was gone. He realized his weakness and then trusted in God for strength instead of himself. He was converted 
and then could strengthen his brethren. What experience did Peter have to go through here? What vision was he given here? Was he given the calzone, the marais, or the marat? Was he not be, did he not have to see himself directly in a vision with Christ? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. We all do. We all need this. So when Peter is confronted with the Marab vision, the looking glass vision, after he has cursed and swore that he knew not Christ. Jesus looked upon Peter. Peter had to face Christ. Then is when Peter remembered the words of the Lord. He was put through a test, a very hard test, a test that brought Peter right to his own needs, to his own issues, because he had given such a, a boastful pronouncement that he would be willing and able to die for his Lord. And then when he is given the opportunity, when he is given the opportunity to stand up for Christ, he couldn't do it. The greatest lesson many have yet to learn is to know themselves. <clears throat> they are ignorant of themselves. Mr. York and Mr. Davis and some others whose names I cannot call express much love to God and the truth in words. But they are not converted to God. They are not acquainted with themselves. They do not search their own heart and walk tremblingly and fearfully before the Lord. They profess to leave everything with the Lord and to have much faith, but it is words and noise instead of faith. They do not know what a humble, self-abasing, God-trusting faith is. They are puffed up and exalted. Their fruits, their works, testify to the nature of their faith. How much of our faith is nothing more than words? May we begin to know ourselves better starting today. Mm -hmm. God is not pleased or his cause benefited by persons embracing the truth without being reformed and elevated by the truth, but coming along with their untidy, loose habits and making no efforts to reform. The lives of such are disgusting believers and to the true orderly children of God. If there is a conference, this certain class will generally attend. If they are home, it would be far better for the cause of God. And then they would not be in the way of unbelievers. Their presence is not needed. They are only a burden and hindrance. And they will be doing a good work if they will stay at home 
and confine their influence to as small a circle as possible. They could benefit the cause much more by being economical of their time. Instead of spending time to attend meetings where they are only a burden, they had better be laboring with their hands to obtain means to pay for their paper and, cert and obtain religious books upon present truth with which they could inform themselves and also have something to expend in dress to make a more decent, respectable appearance among Sabbath keepers where they live. God's people have been burdened and imposed upon for a long time by Solomon Cottrell's family. They would attend meetings anywhere within their reach, go a considerable distance to crowd themselves into meetings where their room was much more to be preferred than their presence. Their hearts were full of rebellion. They had no union with the body. The meetings did not improve them. They would return home from the meetings to make their bitter remarks upon this one and that, and the different articles of dress and the preaching which did not suit them and against the gifts. Any system or discipline they opposed. The church should have taken a straightforward course and dealt with plainness and due severity in the name of the Lord shaken off these dead weights long ago. The church should have left them to go with their kind. The admonition that she is giving here is very direct. Yet it is a, an admonition that is needed yet today. Those who will remain low and will not be elevated and disciplined by the rules of the church those who will not be elevated but fight against reform, against order and advancement, should not be dragged along against their will. And if they choose to intrude among those who love order, system, and discipline, and annoy them with their bold and rebellious speeches, the church should cut loose from them and leave them. It is a wide world. They can take the course which they love, and leave the saints to enjoy their peace, order, and system without intruding themselves among them. If such ones are dealt with, there will always be enough to sympathize with them. However great the wrong of some may be, there are those who will sustain and excuse them in sin and sympathize with them if the church deals with them. Why, even Satan had sympathizers when he rebelled, and the sympathizers were turned out of heaven with Satan for their rebellious sympathy. Yeah, so just going back, remember that Solomon Cottrell, he's the brother of Roswell uh, Cottrell. Okay. All right, so these are the brothers that she's. Uh, referencing here and so the Cottrells um, right and he's going to be the, the great grandfather of uh, Raymond Cottrell correct right so Raymond Cottrell was born in 1911 so uh, 1911 Rob or 1912 okay uh, well I have 1911 here um, so so anyway, they he became uh, Roswell. I think is the first one that became an Adventist uh, under Miller. No, I you think, think it's so? okay. the second one. What what I what I've read so far is that they attended different presentations by Father Miller, right. but did not choose to become. Okay. Associated with the church until after the great disappointment. 
Yeah, so he joined the Adventist Church in 1851. Roswell did. Okay. Roswell. Um, yeah, so, but he had attended the meetings of Miller. Right. Okay, but yeah, he didn't. I mean, I don't know how you would uh, join the Millerite movement. I'm not particularly sure how organized it was in that sense, but but he, he had attended them. But yeah, he became an Adventist in 1851. So what, I, what I'm looking at, is those that came through the great disappointment those 50 were the basis for the church mm -hmm. those that joined later here are the Cottrells, along with uriah smith mm -hmm. they are ones that came in later into the church uriah smith and his influence shows that he really did not have an understanding of that which Father Miller had preached. And I think the case will be able to be made that the Cottrell family, generation by generation, did not fully understand that which Father Miller had preached either. Mm -hmm. they were so willing to be critical that they were so willing to tear other portions of the message apart that by the time you come down to Raymond Cottrell you have a generation that does not understand the first generation has no clue about the second or the third mm -hmm. and is going in a direction that is entirely the antithesis of that which Father Miller had been pointing people for. Yeah, because Cottrell is the one who introduces the uh, textual criticism and so forth into Adventism. Well, he's also one that is very critical of everything that was written by both Jones and Wagner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we still see that that whole idea in people like uh, George Knight. Exactly. And of course, Froome was influenced by Cottrell, or Cottrell, how you say his name. Well, I've also noted that one of Cottrell's very dear friends was Desmond Ford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ford as well. So, Mr. York is everywhere introducing the Sabbath, getting into a discussion with unbelievers among upon disputed doctrinal points. His talk sets those with whom he talks farther from the truth he makes those with whom he talks despise him he is so boastful so exalted in his own eyes and all sabbath keepers are judged by some who are prejudiced to be like him he increases prejudice against the truth for his works and his daily walk are not according to his talk or his profession he is not an imitator of the holy pattern his general course and the course of Mr. Davis are a reproach to the cause of present truth. They talk or say and do not. There are several of this same class in Mill Grove and in surrounding towns. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth good fruit is hewn down. The every tree that bringeth forth, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7, 16 to 20. 
Could we also apply regarding the situation in Mill Grove that this is like a little leaven leavening the entire lump? That this disaffection that Mr. York, the Cottrells, and others are promoting that that disaffection, just like a little bit of leaven, is spreading through that entire church. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Luke 6, 45. The character of every man is made manifest by his fruits. His words and profession are of no value in the sight of God. His works, his acts testify of him and reveal the heart and the true purpose of the man. What can we say about this statement? What can we note about this? Well, it certainly bears, a, <clears throat> you know, it stands for the truth of Matthew 7, 20, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. And as James said, he said, you know, faith is manifested by your works. Faith without proper good works is dead. Right. Those who are so ignorant of the grace of God upon the heart should in humility learn of Christ and should be very modest in their conversation. They had better be reserved about introducing the truth to unbelievers until they can adorn it by good fruits and by their daily walk show that they have been learning of him who is meek and lowly of heart. There are those at Mill Grove and vicinity who are sincere in their faith and who earnestly desire to advance with the people of God. Some have opposing companions and friends, which has made the battle very hard for them. And then to have the additional discouragement of having in the church professed Sabbath keepers who are rebellious and undisciplined, who are slack and loose in all their business transactions, and yet are zealous to attend meetings and take an active part is heartrending. They come full of darkness and their course, their daily walk and general deportment is a continual reproach to the cause of God. And they keep those out who love order, cleanliness, discipline and refinement. Sister Eggleston has been in danger of going to the opposite extreme in some things. Her husband is not in the faith. The influence of those who profess to be Sabbath keepers yet bore no fruit to the glory of God has been such as to disgust him and cause him to shut his eyes to the light. He thinks that a great portion of Sabbath keepers are like a certain class in Mill Grove, and he and other unbelievers think. It is their faith, their peculiar views, which makes them what they are, slack, untidy, and undisciplined. And although their judgment is convinced that we have the truth, the inconsistent lives of professed Sabbath keepers shut them away from the society and the influence of those Sabbath keepers whose life and influence would be a recommendation to the faith. Sister Eggleston's husband, 
would now be established in the truth if there had been a right influence among Sabbath keepers in and about Mill Grove. This entire situation with this one church is a microcosm of many of the issues that we are facing now, both within the church and within the movement. God requires his people to arise and shake off hindering clogs. And then when laborers come among them, they will be benefited and will not stop to notice this article of dress and that apron or bonnet. But all will take hold earnestly to arise. Each will attend to his and her own case. Seek ye all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah 2, verse 3. The meek of the earth who keep God's commandments are here addressed. All should lay hold of the truth and let it elevate them. They should take hold of the work in earnest. Some are very fearful of being like the world. And those who express the most fear in this matter are those whose lives are not circumspect and a recommendation to their faith. Their fear should be exercised in a different direction. And they fear lest they give unbelievers occasion to speak reproachfully of our faith. How can we speak? How can we show our faith if we are boastful, proud, and arrogant? Does that type of an attitude properly reflect Christ? We are now a sect everywhere spoken against, and we are by some accounted the off-scoring of all things. Many unbelievers say it is only the weak-minded and the poor, low class of society, who believe these singular doctrines. And the inconsistent course of some professed Sabbath keepers gives them occasion to say such things. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. 1 Corinthians 4.9 It is of the highest importance that Sabbath keepers live out their faith in every particular. They should be prompt and neat and keep their business matters all straight. If they believe the truth from the heart, they will do this. The truth will, if carried out, reform their lives. Is there an admonition that Mrs. White is giving us here? Is there words of instruction in what has just been read? There certainly is. None should be so fearful of being like the world that it will lead them to be careless in their houses, leaving things in disorder and cleanliness. It is no pride to be neat in dress. Cleanly in person, orderly and tasteful in their household arrangements, in their yards, and around their houses. 
These outside appearances tell the business character of those living in the house. And not only this, but the religious character of its inmates. It is impossible for a slack disorderly person to make a good Christian. Their lives in temporal and religious things are just as disorderly as their dress, their houses, their persons and premises. How are we to show our faith? What kind of example do we give? There is order in heaven. There are rules and regulations which govern the whole heavenly host. All move in order. All there is cleanly, all in perfect harmony. And everyone who will be counted worthy to enter heaven will be thoroughly disciplined and will be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The uncultivated have spots and wrinkles upon them now. They had better lose no time in connecting the work of cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. God loves purity, cleanliness, order, and holiness. God requires all his people who lack these qualifications to seek them and never rest until they obtain them. They must commence the work of reform and elevate their lives so that in conversation and deportment, their acts, their lives will be a continual recommendation of their faith and will have such a winning, compelling power upon unbelievers that they will be compelled to acknowledge that they are the children of God. When the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, was God not showing them that not only is he capable of keeping his word, but that he does keep his word exactly as he says. Yet by the time we come to Exodus chapter 19, God is willing to lay out for the children of Israel his desire to enter into a covenant with them. And when he so enters, looks to enter into this covenant, does he not look to make of the nation of the children of Israel a nation of priests unto himself? Yet, by rejecting the covenant, the children of Israel were choosing to reject God. But one small group of the family of Levi chose to stand with God. And to them at that time fell the honor of being priests unto God. The church as a whole, as a total body, was very much like that of the children of Israel.
God sought to enter into a covenant relationship, yet this was again rejected. Today, the movement is called upon to commence the work of reform so that our lives may be so examined by our conversation, by the way that we act, that the movement will be a continual recommendation of faith in God and will have a winning, compelling power upon unbelievers, both in and out of the church, that others will be compelled to acknowledge that those that have accepted the reform in their lives, that by their conversation and their actions, that these are the children of God. Are we not given the opportunity to be hid from the day of God's wrath? Are we willing to act upon this or are we going to be slack about it? What say you today? God does not require people to take a course so merely to make the world hate them and to be their enemies. If they do this, of what advantage will it be to spend time, strength, and means to spread the truth? Those who profess the truth should be living examples, living epistles, known and read of all men, and should ever introduce the truth in a manner which will commend itself to the understanding and the good judgment of the intelligent and the honest unbeliever. To have novices continually babbling upon the Sabbath and present truth will only make the truth disgusting and will cause it and its true believers to be reproached. Ignorant boasters had better hold their peace, whose mouths must be stopped. Titus 1.11. They should show their diligence and zeal in laboring with their hands and attending to their own souls, setting their own hearts in order. This I greatly fear they will never do. They had rather be attending to other people's matters and babbling upon things of which they have no knowledge. As I grew up, one of the points that was being drilled into me repeatedly was it was best that I keep my own doorstep clean. Not worry about what my brother or my sister were doing. Worry about my own issues. We have many today that pursue a course where they are willing to be critical of others and not be critical of themselves. It's always easier to point fingers, never recognizing if you point one, you have more than that pointed right back at you. We are not to make the world hate us. We are not to make enemies. We are not to turn to the right or to the left. 
we are to walk upon the path that Christ puts before us. We are to be as living examples, living letters known and read of all men. Letting them read by our examples the truth that is in Christ. This is the work that is put before us. Not to criticize others, not to tear apart the word and the message that God has given, not to try to tear down the tables that have been presented and preserved. The Cottrell family were of those that were willing to be critical and they found it easy to complain about others. They spent more time indolently addressing things without truly addressing that which was within their own hearts. May this not be said of us. Now, are there any other comments or questions regarding what we have been addressing today? Well, I just put a link in the chat. Okay. And this link is, well, it's in the Wayback Machine, so that's the only place you can find it. But it's a, uh, an article by Raymond Cottrell called The Sanctuary Doctrine, Asset or Liability. Kind of interesting because I ran into this article a week ago. Okay. I wasn't using the Wayback Machine to do it. Oh, okay. The, the point... I'm sure it's somewhere else, yeah, but this is where okay. I am. <laughs> well, at this, at this point, when we get... We, I, I would commend this article to be read, but I'll be very direct. I'm not impressed with the manner in which it was written, and I'm not impressed with the manner in which it was footnoted. No, and you will also see the the type of thing that Ellen White's talking about, the criticism of others. I mean it's 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 you know very polemical. Lots of the language in it, the attitude about others is exactly the thing that we don't want to manifest in our own lives. So it's an example of how not uh, to present your views on something. But I find it intriguing when we look at this, especially with this article. And it's it's something that, as I have been looking at this through the week, it gives a absolute crystal example, crystal clear, perfectly framed of what it means to be of the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what are you saying about the footnotes improperly? Could you put that on email? Could you put that on email? I'll send them out. On, I'll, I'll send some of this out on email later, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. Thanks, I'd like to read that too. You're saying something about the footnotes here? Yes. As I've been reading the article, the footnoting is, it, it's lacking. Okay. I, I've learned a good bit about how a, a footnote can be formatted using some of the, the more modern tools. I just find that there's a lot of things that are lacking in the way that Cottrell footnoted this article. Okay. And I'll send examples of this okay. for you to look over later. Okay. So the main thing that we need to learn, of course, is we're not going to be criticizing all those other people. We need to be looking at ourselves. Right. 
I mean, as I said, it's easy to see the faults in others, not so easy to see the faults in yourself. Well, the, the one point about this article mm -hmm. for, your, for consideration of all of us is it is not representing righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. But yet, Cottrell believes that it did. Mm -hmm. So there's there's actually quite a bit there for us to consider. Yeah. Any other comments or questions today? Okay. One of the verses I was getting was Philippians 1 6, that he that has begun a good work in me will perform it until the end. I know I have some of the weaknesses that are described in these passages, and I was kind of hopeless that I would ever be able to overcome them, but I'm going to take hold of it, and with his help, I will overcome them. Amen. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath, for the rest from our physical labors. We thank you for the opportunity, Father, of considering this which has been written for our, for our admonition. Direct us now, guide us today. Help us so that we may be the literal, literal living examples and epistles of that which true faith is. Help us so that if we encounter others, that we may more properly represent your character. Direct us in these paths. Guide us in that which we say. To your glory, for the advancement of your kingdom. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.